testing. Oh, that's really good. So, um, I'm not sure how much those of you follow our calendar, but um, typically uh, Lama Chimpa would be here, not me. And he was, he's going to give the talk, but just at a later day to talk um, with his friend. Uh, I, I don't know her full name, but uh, she is a, a physician that uh, he has a lot of respect for, and he thinks she has something very special to share with all of you. But um, today, as some of you have noticed, we have security, extra security that we typically don't have. But going forward, we will have a little extra. I'm not sure to the level, but it'll be enough to make everybody here feel comfortable. That is our wish, at least. And um, and uh, in the spirit of transparency, um, of, uh, maybe it's been going on for it's a few weeks, at least. Um, a person that's not a member of our center um, who has mental illness has been uh, emailing us um, just kind of emails that don't make sense usually, but recently he started to escalate. And um, so because of that, we're just erring on the side of caution. And um, we've noted this whole neighborhood is aware of this person, and now you are too. And um, I feel we're really safe here. Uh, we have hired an outside person just to make sure. But this is a temporary situation, however, this temporary difficulty has caused us all to work really, really closely together, which um, our teacher has a big sense of humor and he likes that. Like uh, sometimes we we uh, don't understand each other, but this particular thing has brought us all together, I feel. Like we all really care and we're just like working together, which is just beautiful. So um, I had one day to prepare for this talk, which is my excuse for, uh, you know, I don't know how you'll receive it, but... Um, I just tell myself, you're all my friends, and that helps me. Everybody here is my friend, and that helps me a lot. So about, I don't know what time, yesterday, I, to be honest, any any of my friends here that are members here could do the same thing as me. I look to other people to help me give this talk, because on my own, I wouldn't be able to give you the talk you deserve. So um, I just want to say that right off the bat. But the topic I asked permission to speak on is the 37 practices of a bodhisattva. And um, I chose this because His Holiness the Dalai Lama, um, I'm assuming most people know who that is, but maybe if you're brand new, you don't, I don't know. But this image behind me is um, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And every year he gives a talk about this topic, the 37 practices of a bodhisattva. And so I listened to him and uh, that helped me inspire inspire this talk for today. And also, I thought it would be helpful to people like myself that are just beginners to um, maybe hear the, a story, which I felt uh, was very inspiring and also humbling to see what a bodhisattva uh, looks like. So um, this person is, uh name is Kun, Kunu Lama Rinpoche. And um, I once, maybe, it, and it's been 10 years, I taught, I referred to him um, because I I don't even know how I heard about him. But the little bit I heard at the beginning made me want to know more about him. And so, um, yet in my last talk, I just spoke about him, just touched on, on his life. And I want to talk about him before the 37 practices of a bodhisattva. So, um, like I said, his name... It's Kunu Lama Rinpoche, and the title of this article is from FPMT, which is they're friends of ours. Uh, they're, uh, that's an acronym for the Foundation of the Preservation of Buddhist Thought, and they offer classes too, and um, they're good friends of ours. Anyway, um, somebody from their organization wrote this article about Kunu Lama Rinpoche, and um, her name is Beth Halford. And so... I want to read everything Beth wrote, even though everything she wrote is wonderful, but I, I think it might take too long. So um, so I'll just read it, and I might skim over certain parts of it, and then after that, I'll uh, share with you a little, about, a little bit of a summary about what the Dalai Lama uh, taught about the 37 practices of a bodhisattva. So um, Kumi Lama Tenzin... Gayeltsin Rinpoche, that's a long name, but he he uh, earned that by Tenzin is a name given to students of um, 
His Holiness the Dalai Lama, students who have taken an empowerment from him. And he was born, this is what's so amazing, because sometimes we think we become more civilized as time goes on. But sometimes I think that's not the case. He was born in 1894 in the village of Sunam. I don't want, I can't, I don't want to uh, butcher this, uh, where he was born, but um, I have this article I'm willing to share with anyone who is interested. But it was in the Himalayas of India, not far from the Tibetan border. And he, when he was born, he was born into a noble and wealthy family. And he grew up in this very remote area where despite not being officially recognized as a tulku, his fellow villagers saw signs of special qualities from an early age and his interest in dharma activities. So tulku is a word like we uh, attach to a teacher that is recognized as a, his previous carnation is recognized. Like, for example, um, Jado Rinpoche is considered a tulku, and our teacher, Lama Jimpa, is considered a tulku. So um, in his early years, Kunu Lama lived in a comfortable life with his family, but his, in his late teenage years, his family faced difficulties, culminating with him leaving his family home. This opened the door for the opportunity for Kunu Lama to pursue a spiritual studies, and so his life of Dharma began. So that's kind of like us, some of us here, or many of us here, our life maybe was difficult, and those difficulties turned out to be a treasure because they brought us here. That's how we see it as time goes. So upon renouncing his former life, he left home with nothing, traveling to Manali to collect money he knew was owed to his family and using it to travel to, oh, these names, oh, they're so hard, um, Gangtok and Sik and Sikkim, where he planned to start his Dharma studies. However, soon after his arrival, Kunu Lama realized he wouldn't be able to develop a true and deep understanding of Dharma until he knew how to read and write properly. This became his purpose, and this perspective on literacy, grammar, and composition became his, became one he regularly taught to others. That's another thing about him. Like when we learn something as part of our tradition, we teach it to others or we share with others. Once, once Kumu Lama felt he had enough of his general education to effectively learn Dharma, he traveled to Tibet, spending many years going between Tashi Lumpo and the Kham region, and also spending some time in Lhasa. In Tibet, he received teachings and initiations from many great teachers at the time, becoming a highly respected student and teacher, perfecting his Tibetan language skills, and becoming a scholar of Dharma texts. Kumu Lama met and received teachings from many highly realized and respected lamas, but he never mentioned that he had taken any as his root guru. He did not talk about his gurus in general. Baling Lama is one of his students, I believe is an attendant to Kunu, Kunu Lama Rinpoche. He did, however, encourage others to choose their root guru carefully in order to ensure the teacher was someone who had cultivated true bodhicitta in his heart. So uh, bodhicitta is this uh, big love, bigger than ordinary love. It's a wish to wake up for the benefit of all beings. Kunu Lama made it, would make it clear that the teacher didn't have to be well, a well-known Lama but it was the feeling in the teacher's heart that mattered. Kunu Lama's example of not talking about his gurus is, is a strong teaching on the importance of not sharing certain aspects of practice and experiences with, dhar with dharma. This avoids making something that should be very special into a worldly thing. Despite Kunu Lama's outward appearance of a lay beggar and his immense humbleness, many high lamas and realized practitioners in Tibet could see beyond this and would invite him to teach recognizing his inner qualities and wishing to learn from him. He adopted this appearance to show how someone who looked like a lay person could renounce worldly things, practice dharma with determination, and attain realizations. He aimed to inspire lay people, particularly Himalayans, to live like this, to realize their potential, to practice the path to enlightenment in the most effective and beneficial way. That's why I wanted to share this with all of you, so I thought you could... You know, where since we're not uh, monastics, we can see in ourselves this potential as well. It takes effort and lots of work, but um, others have done it. And uh, that's what he wished to share with the people in the Himalayas. Many people in the Himalayan and Tibetan society thought that monks were the only ones who could practice Dharma. And as a consequence, the lay people would keep their practice simple and superficial. Although Kunu Lama had become a great scholar of the time, he felt the need to deepen his knowledge of Dharma beyond the intellectual. 
studying in the Tibetan language he felt was restricting him from doing so, knowing that the roots of Buddhism were anchored in Sanskrit, Kunu Lama traveled to Var Varanasi to perfect his knowledge of that language and to turn, intensify his understanding of Dharma. My apologies for my broken way I'm reading this, but um, I've only read it twice and that's my excuse. So. Kunu Lama spent many years living as an ascetic in a Hindu temple in Varanasi while also becoming a scholar in Sanskrit and a professor at Sarnath University. Here he wrote his book, The Jewel Lamp, A Praise of Bodhicitta. And then I'm going to go ahead here. His, his reputation as a great scholar began to spread throughout India with many disciples coming to benefit from his incredible kindness, compassion, and wisdom. It was also here in Varanasi where Baling Lama met Kunu Lama for the first time in 1954. And during their meeting, Kunu Lama asked if Baling Lama wished to ordain as a monk and live a spiritual lifestyle. Baling Lama expressed a deep wish to do so, but also shared his reservations. He told Kunu Lama that he wanted to keep his job and regular income. In response, Kunu Lama replied his great wisdom, asking me a simple question. Did I feel I had more wealth to renounce than Atisha or Siddhartha? Of course I did not. And I'm realizing this, I understood that if Atisha and Siddhartha could renounce it all, then I could too. Kunu Lama continued to live a humble life, teaching and studying until once while in Bod Bodhagaya, that's such a famous place, I need to ask Conrad how to pronounce it properly. Bodhagaya. His Holiness Dalai Lama, surrounded by a crowd of people, prostrated to Kunu Lama in the middle of the road. So that's, for us, that's just an incredible thing to happen. This immediately brought Kunu Lama the attention of many, and it changed his life from one of asceticism to near celebrity status. Prior to this public display of immense respect, His Holiness requested Kunu Lama to give him a transmission of Shanti Davis, the Bodhisattva way of life. During this transmission, his Holiness was so overwhelmed by Kunu Lama's knowledge of the text, his level of compassion and purity of mind, that His Holiness asked for a commentary to be provided with the text. His Holiness also requested Kunu Lama to pray for the people of Tibet, but Kunu Lama rejected this. He said he couldn't possibly pray for them as His Holiness was the leader and should therefore be the one to pray for them. Baling Lama recounted that through Kunu Lama's great compassion, he offered to pray for Bodhicitta to flourish in the heart of the leader of China with the hope that Mao Zedong would be the, see the heir of his ways and free the people of Tibet. In addition to his boundless compassion, Kunu Lama would show incredible generosity. Is this okay what I'm reading here? Is that okay? okay. So... I just want to talk to him a little bit. I mean, when I read about him, I, I'm just kind of like just so struck by how he how he was, for, um, like how he, uh, I'll just read a little bit more so you can get an idea why I'm saying this, but maybe I've said enough for you to realize it already, but he gave all he had to those in need while refusing to accept most monetary offerings and passing on food offerings to those he saw as more in need. Baling Lama recalled how Kunu Lama would only cut his hair and shave his face once a month, always visiting the same barber who would charge 50 half a rupee for the cut. And throughout the month, he would say what little offerings he accepted with the intention to pay the hardworking bar barber. It's a very simple act until you realize what he, that he was sacrificing basic uh, necessities to give this barber and, and um, the equanimity we call, uh, that he ex you know, sometimes when we see somebody, we, we kind of know they have status, not status, right? I mean, I do this. We all do this. This person has status. This person doesn't. But Kunu Lama was so beyond that. He he was a truly, and I, I, he was enlightened. I mean, he, he saw people as their true quality. He saw their Buddha nature. So Kunu Lama's unusual and simple approach to life wasn't limited, limited to the way he dressed or groomed himself choosing not to own any holy objects or statues of any kind, his practice centered on the text. He revered the most, Shanti Divas, the Bodhisattva way of life, which we have in our library, and which 
um, there's been a, a, a series of talks given here on, on the Bodhisattva way of life by Geshe Damcho, who teaches here on Thursdays at six o'clock. If any of you are interested in um, receiving teachings from a very special, special person. So uh, Kuna Lama would say, there was no harm in people having statues if it helped them remind them of the qualities of the Buddha, but they needed to be, to already have some appreciation of these qualities. Otherwise, the statues would not serve to remind them of anything. Without true understanding, it would just be a piece of metal with no real benefit. Bailey Lama likened it to crossing an ocean. If we haven't yet crossed, we really need a boat to get to the other side. But if we have already reached to the other side, there's no need for a boat. Kumu Lama, I'm just going to read a little, I'm not going to read all of it, um, but I, I will uh, let anyone here know where they can find it so they can finish if they like. But he, he said, um, he, he said this, I thought this was interesting. He said, Kumu Lama would never participate in formal retreat. Instead, Kumu Lama's whole life was like an inner retreat. If he was requested to give a teaching or felt there would be a benefit for him to give one, he would break his practice to do so, and the rest of the time he would practice focusing on the, a guide to the Bodhisattva way of life. Day and night he would read and meditate on its pages. Kunu Lama was never seen sleeping by Bailing Lama, only pausing to eat and on rare occasions rest his head in front of the text. Okay. And then at the very end they, they talked, um, uh, he he identified himself not as, in our, in our tradition, we have four schools, Nyingma, Kagyu, Sakya, and, and Gelug. We're, we're a Gelug, uh, our tradition is the yellow hats, our Gelug tradition. But he, he didn't identify with any of the four schools. He instead identified himself as a student of Nagarjuna. I just thought that was so interesting, really. He, um, didn't, he thought it was important not to forget the importance of Shakyamuni Buddha and to help remind people he would give a copy of praise to Shakyamuni Buddha to everyone who visited him, whoever they were, even His Holiness the 16th Karmapa from the Kar Kargyu school. So it's amazing. <laughs> so anyway, so this, this is not too hard to find. If you just look up Kunu, K-H-U-N-U, Lama Rinpoche, this pops up right away, thankfully, because now I had something to share with you guys today. So let's see what time it is. So it's 11.34, and then, um, as I mentioned, the Dalai Lama every year, at least once a year, because I, I looked on YouTube in 2018, 2017, 2015, last December, he's teaching on the 37 practices of a bodhisattva. So uh, um, I wanted to just read his summary and then uh, I I had Dylan download the 37 practices I thought we could say um, maybe a couple of them and meditate for like a minute or two in between each one does that sound okay for everybody okay I feel I I feel scared but not of an outer person. <laughs> I'm scared of my own feelings because I'm I run really nervous, which I thought um long ago when I started this practice, I thought I'd become completely different. At least I hope so. I hoped I'd be kind of like um like on, on that that app where people are very interested and you just go on the app and their voice is slow, like, you know, it's just so calming, you know. But instead I found out I instead of that, what happened to me is I became uh, more willing to be transparent, more willing to uh, admit my own faults before other people's faults. Even though I'm not all the way there, I understand that um, that it's not outside myself. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Carmen. So, um, Rinpoche, I call Lama Jimpa Rinpoche, which means precious Buddha, but he couldn't, he'll respond to Lamala, no problem. No problem. Some people have called him that so many years, they, they feel it in their heart. And you know, like if I suddenly, my name's Patty, if I said, please call me Kathy, I just chose you because you're nice. But I would probably respond, but I'd be 
maybe not paying attention at the first first call. <laughs> but Rinpoche is Rinpoche to me. So um, I'm with him a lot, but I'm, to be honest, I'm with him. Well, he's with others. I'm watching him help others. That's, I'm, I'm with him to witness what it looks like to help others. So um, the Dalai Lama, this summary are not my, this is not my words. He has special people that uh, transcribe his talk and summarize, and they do a really good job. So like, if you just want to hear, you know, like you just can't read for whatever reason, you can go on YouTube and write Dalai Lama and you'll see all these opportunities to hear teachings from the Dalai Lama. That's technology has brought the Dalai Lama here. I mean, his words. So this is really special. So that's what I did. So, um, so this person that wrote the summary of the Dalai Lama, he says this, the 30, this is, uh, just given a kind of a, just a glimpse of what's very precious teaching. The 37 practices begins by paying homage to Avalokiteshvara, who is praised by all the Buddhas and has accomplished all qualities, and who, while seeing that all phenomena lack coming and going, makes a single-minded effort for the good of all living beings. So um, I really liked this simple summary because um, Lamala, you know, I tend to, I, I talk about relative bodhicitta. That's like I'm giving and I'm helping these outside. That's relative bodhicitta. But um, he wanted me to mention, uh, I can mention this uh, about ultimate bodhicitta, which is beyond words, actually. And that's what the Dalai Lama is, trying, is referring to. This uh, empty, what we call emptiness, which um, when I first started, I'll just mention because some of you might have this misnotion that I had, which I thought emptiness was like nothingness. You know, that's what I thought. But um, then I found out is it, instead it's this uh, emptiness is, which is beyond words. So even my words wouldn't be able to approach what it is. But it's um, inter, a radical interdependence with everything that is myself and this. Um, Part of our practice is looking for this self that cannot be found and looking out at phenomena in the same way. It's just this something that's beyond what I can talk about, really. But I just wanted to mention that because he told me I don't mention that. So even though I only give one talk a year now, because all my friends have pitched in. Anyway, um, this is uh, the summary from the Dalai Lama. Whatever exists does not do so from its own side. Things exist by way of designation. People and things are dependently arisen, and it's because of that that it's important that we live in harmony with each other. The text tells us to listen to explanations of how this is referring to the 37 practices of a bodhisattva. The text tells us to listen to explanations of how people and things lack inherent existence, to reflect on what we've learned and meditate on what we've understood. I make the awakening mind of bodhicitta and the wisdom understanding emptiness the core of my practice. If you can, when you wake in the morning, generate bodhicitta, then your negative thoughts will subside and you'll find peace of mind. Bodhicitta brings happiness and well-being to others and to ourselves. I find that training my mind to cultivate bodhicitta not only brings peace of mind, but enhances my sense of physical well-being. Bodhicitta makes you relax and able to sleep soundly. It sets your mind at ease. You'll no longer be jealous or competitive. I grew up basking in my mother's loving kindness and later learned formally about cultivating bodhicitta. Now I'm 88 years old, almost 90, and I have a calm, relaxed mind. Of course, accumulating merit and wisdom ultimately takes us to enlightenment, but in my experience, we can also feel the effect they have on our day-to-day -day lives. There are several explanations about how to generate bodhicitta but even if you can't think deeply about them, if you can cultivate a warm-hearted attitude towards others, it will bring you peace of mind. His Holiness took up the 37 practices and read through the verses. So this is highlighting this teaching, which I'm going to share with you from a site called Latsawa House. His Holiness took up the 37 practices and read through the verses, highlighting the advice to give up your homeland, cultivates seclusion, let go of this life, give up bad friends, cherish the spiritual teacher, 
take refuge in the three jewels, never do wrong, aspire to the never changing supreme state of liberation and develop the altruistic intention. These are the practices of a bodhisattva. The text goes on, exchange your own happiness for the suffering of others. Dedicate your body, possessions, and your virtue, past, present, and future, to those who steal from you. Take all the other misdeeds upon yourself. When someone disparages you, place them as you would your spiritual teacher on the crown of your head. Take on the misdeeds and the pain of all living beings. See all worldly fortune as without essence. Subdue your own mind. Does that sound familiar? We did a prayer. Subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. We say that every time we're together. Abandon clinging attachment and do not take to mind inherit a science of subject and object. This, His Holiness remarked, refers to emptiness. Don't regard things as real and give up attachment. See them as illusory and safeguard your ethical discipline. Along with skillful means, cultivate the wisdom which does conceive the three spheres as real. His Holiness mentioned that with regard to emptiness, it's important to study the middle way Madhyamaka treatises such as Nagarjuna's Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way, Aryadeva's 400 Verses, and most especially Chandrakirti's Entering the Middle Way. So this is uh, something impossible for you to remember if you haven't heard of these books, but they're very important in our tradition. And like I said, I'm willing to share anything I've referred to today with anyone here. The text continues examining your own errors. Rid yourself of them. Don't mention the faults of those who have entered the great vehicle. Give up attachment to the households of friends, relations, and benefactors. Give up harsh words. Destroy disturbing emotions like attachment as soon as they arise. Whatever you are doing, ask yourself, what's the state of my mind? And finally, dedicate the virtue from making such effort to enlightenment. This is the practice of Bodhisattva. Having completed his reading of the teaching on the 37 practices, His Holiness reminded his listeners that the essence is to have a good heart, to be determined not to be a, not to part from the wish to benefit sentient beings. To have the, an altruistic mind is what's most important. So I'm so glad I read his words instead of trying this. Uh, I'm so glad I read the words of His Holiness the Dalai Lama because, you know, I can't, I, because I'm, that's the best, you know. So I, I, I'm going to share another. Well, that's better, huh? Maybe you guys can hear me anyway. I don't know. Can you guys hear me? A lot of people complain about me and my voice. They're like, oh, Patty, can't understand you. I'm like, then I, I go from way too soft where everybody's kind of looking at me confused to, whoa, Patty, that sounds aggressive, you know. <laughs> I'm not sure. I haven't got the middle way on that one. <laughs> So this, uh, the 37 practices of all the bodhisattvas, um, I want to uh, call out Kathy because Kathy, Kathy right here, Kathy helped us uh, for a time uh, meditate upon these. And it was so special when Kathy was doing that. And I really, I really uh, think maybe that's what caused me to choose this topic for today because of Kathy. And they, I, brought, I was like, oh yeah, that was so special at the time. Okay, so someone, uh, I was thinking, oh, I'll choose what's the best ones or something like that, but that's impossible. Oh, thanks, Connie. That's impossible. I can't pick the best ones. I don't know how to do that. Sorry. Thank you so much. But, um, you know, I, I just wanted to share today... Uh, because I thought, well, how am I going to give a talk with one day notice? You know, like, how is, you know, I don't have enough. Uh, I'm not a scholar, you know. I'm like all of you here. I'm just no different. But be, that, I hope, will inspire you to do what I did. Like, oh, I don't know, but, you know, the Dalai Lama, you know. And there's other teachers, too. I could give a little list. I um, have a dar what's called darshan with my teacher here. Lama Yeshi Jimpa, and that has helped me in a way that it cannot be really um, expressed really with words. Anyway, so the 37 practices. So what I'll do, I'll read one. I was just going to meditate one minute. That's it. 
and then so I just kind of slow it so maybe it can uh, sink in and then on your own you can do it for longer so oh <laughs> that might have been a mistake huh? this this gong was donated to us by a person that's not here today named Paul Nolan and um you know, sometimes we might not want to ring a gong because we might think, I don't know how to ring a gong, but that's why this is good. You don't have to know how. Oh, thank you. This gong rings perfectly no matter who you are. <laughs> it's really true. It's a really, this artist made this. Okay, so... The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to study, reflect, and meditate tirelessly, both day and night, without ever straying into idleness, in order to free oneself and others from this ocean of samsara, having gained the supreme vessel of free, well-favored human life so difficult to find. Practice, the, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to leave behind one's, uh -oh. sorry, I kind of cut off. I'm going to do it the number three. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to take to solitary places, avoiding the unwholesome so that destructive emotions gradually fade away. And in the absence of distraction, virtuous practice naturally gains strength. Whilst with awareness clearly focused, we can we gain conviction in the teachings. Number six, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to cherish spiritual friends by regarding them as even more precious than one's own body, since they are the ones who will help to rid us of all our faults and make our virtues grow ever greater, just like the waxing moon. Number 11, the practice of all the bodhisattvas is to make genuine exchange of one's own happiness and well-being for all the sufferings of others. Since all misery comes from seeing, seeking happiness for oneself alone, while perfect Buddhahood is born from the wish for others' good.
even if others should declare before the world all manner of unpleasant things about me, to speak only of their qualities in return, with a mind that's filled with love, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. practice of all the bodhisattvas is to let go of grasping when encountering things one finds pleasant or attractive. Consider them to be like rainbows in the summer skies, beautiful in appearance, yet in truth devoid of any substance. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to cultivate wisdom beyond the three conceptual spheres alongside skillful means, since it is not possible to attain the perfect level of awakening through the other five parameters alone in wisdom's absence. In short, no matter what one might be doing, by examining always the status of one's mind with continuous mindfulness and alertness to bring about the good of others, this is the practice of all the bodhisattvas. The practice of all the bodhisattvas is to dedicate towards enlightenment, all the virtue to be gained through making effort in these ways with wisdom that is purified entirely of the three conceptual spheres so as to dispel the sufferings of the infinity of beings. Here I have set down for those who wishes to wish to follow the Bodhisattva path. I'm sorry, my copies have been a little bit cut off, but I want to make sure to to give credit to Gayelse Tokme Zangpo. I mean, he lived in the 14th century, which is so incredible. And um, and then the earlier um, um, I don't have um, I I just I guess I just want to emphasize like this is a long time ago. Um, we think we're getting more civilized and things like that. At least sometimes that's the kind of ideas people have that things are getting better and better. But if we really look closely, they know that um, selfishness and greed and things like that have all yeah, they were there then too, of course. But uh, you know. I'm really glad you're all here is what I want to say. <laughs> so that's a, concluding my talk. Um, and uh, I guess I ask for questions or comments. If, if anyone has any, I'm happy to take your question. If I don't know, I just say that. I don't know. <laughs> any questions or online questions? Oh, thank you.
Thank you, Patty. Uh, yeah, thank it's you. It's always nice to hear about this practice because it's it's great. So mm -hmm. I think we all appreciate that. Thanks, Carmen. Oh. Uh, Dan Martin says, no questions, but sincere thank you for this inspiration. Oh, thank you, Dan. I don't know. Who, I didn't see who's here. Now I turn around and I see my friends. Yeah. I know. I always know Dirk because of the cat. It, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't have my glasses, so I don't know who's the person who's like outer space, like the moon. Oh, <laughs> hi. Hey. <laughs> Do you have anything more to share with us today? Um, I just, um, I, uh, I'm just really glad you guys came because, you know, because of you, we're here. You know, we really, um, we at one time met in a little, um, a Quaker church, um, before this space, and then before that, before I was around, they met in a little house, and and Lama's teacher, um. He uh, wasn't really about places. He was about inside, like our, in our, our heart. Our heart mind is our temple. But because we have a space, we can have host you. And um, so I'm just so grateful that we have a space. And we have a space because of the generosity of some people that are here and some that aren't here. But um, I'm so grateful. That's all I want to say. Okay. Um, I think we have some announcements. Do we do dedication, dedication. first? Oh, let's do dedication. Yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, can you turn this up a little bit? All right. Is that better? Okay. So dedication. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain a state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that is not arisen arise and grow May that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. May land and circle pass no mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Shenrezi, Tenzin Jatsu, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Well sung. Magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators, please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokitesh Father, great treasure of octopus compassion, Manjushri, master of flawless wisdom, Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of miles, Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages, Rosandrapa, Make request at your holy feet. Um, so announcements uh, is the men's who's leaving the men's group today? It's next week. Next week. Oh, next right. Okay. Um, we have uh, you know important teachers coming up. Lee Rinpoche will be coming up next month. Um, Geshe Damsho is teaching on Thursdays at six p.m. followed by meditation at seven. Uh, what else? Do, do you want to mention about our Geshe's teaching? Um, cancer lesson or not? Uh, yeah, we might as well. Um, so, Lee Rinpoche is coming at the end of May, and then in the middle of June, uh, Kenshin Rinpoche Rosan Dalek will be coming as well. Uh, he was here and he gave um, Bajra Yagini uh, initiation not quite a year ago, I think. Um, so, he's really important. He's one of Geshe Domsho's and uh, Rosan's teachers. So, we like him. He's very fun to have around. Um, and then after that, end of June, we get Lama's birthday and Dalai Lama's birthday, and we've got Sagadawa coming. Sagadawa is coming. Yeah. Sagadawa is the 23rd of May. I think we're going to celebrate it on the 26th. Um, so we have a committee working on that to make that happen. And if you want to help with any of the other preparations for Lingua Pache or King Shore Pache, please see Patty, Jen, or me, or Susan Farrar, and we can all help with that. Got another announcement. In preparation for Ling Rinpoche's visit, uh, we do usually take an op the opportunity when uh, high level teachers are coming to kind of spruce the place up. And since it's spring, the garden's needing some assistance on May 18th, which is uh, Saturday. 
will meet here at 9 a.m. for a garden party. And if you're interested in participating in garden maintenance, watering, things like that, it's a good time to get trained on how things are done, where things are at, and become part of a schedule. We'd love to see you there, May 18th at 9 a.m. Thank you. Cool. Okay. I found a cell phone, so if you lost your cell phone, come see me. Yeah, you don't want to lose your cell phone. Um, anything else? Any other announcements? Yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate you all coming today. Thank you so much, and thank you very much, Patty, for the wonderful talk. Um, just another reminder, please make sure you leave through the garden door. Uh, if you have any questions, um, let us know. And thank you so much for showing up. We appreciate your support. There was a donation box in the back. There's another one in the dojo. Or uh, if you just want to leave an envelope of cash on the table, that's fine. Remember. Become a member. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That would be so so wonderful. Right. Yeah. But thank you so much. Have a wonderful and safe Sunday. Omo araya pasaya na indi. Om araya pasaya na.